When the Great Depression hit in the 1930s, America fell on hard times. Many people were jobless, homeless, or hungry. For some, there was no escape from the misery, but for those with a dime to spare, relief could be found at the movies. I remember going in for a dime, or six cents one time, and we, we'd see the movie about two or three, sometimes we stayed there from, from the beginning till the last, we see it three times. Whether it was horror, comedy, mystery or gangsters, depression era audiences flocked to the theaters, developing another new national pastime. Millions of Americans lost themselves in spectacle or indulged their fascination with the rich and powerful. The Depression fed the growth of the American film industry for many years. It also inspired filmmakers to explore the suffering, the courage, the frustration and the desperation of Americans who lived through it. The trouble with capitalism is capitalists. They're too damn greedy. The central principle of capitalism is to be one step ahead of everyone else, to be the first to buy a stock that you think may ultimately appreciate in value, and then as others buy more and more of it, the price of that stock will realize a profit. To be the first to sell a highly priced stock before everyone else gets nervous and starts to dump their stock and the price comes down. In that case, you would lose your money if you weren't one step ahead of the herd. This is exactly what happens in October of 1929 kind of panic sets in. In a little over a month, between September and October 1929, the U.S. stock market first slid, then crashed, causing economic disaster for investors, banks, and businesses. By the last week of October, there are a series of massive trading days where stock values start to plummet. This triggers the Great Depression itself, one, because so many people lose their savings and their accumulated uh, funds literally overnight. So when people lose all of this money, they start to buy less and less in the marketplace, obviously. And that further depresses the sales and the profitability of firms. The second reason this triggers a Great Depression, as we call it, is that as the stock market collapses, investors become much more pessimistic about the future. So even those investors who have some money on hand will sit back and say, well, I'm not going to invest now. And as more and more investors hold back this way, it only accelerates the process of collapse. Many observers believe the effects of the crash would be short-lived and the economy would recover quickly. But as weeks turned into months and months into years, it became clear that the nation had entered an unprecedented economic depression. This was both the deepest depression in American history and the longest in duration. Uh, and in some ways, it's the first economic crisis that this country faced when it was fully in the industrial era. And it just, it's more vulnerable to this kind of shock than a less fully developed economy was earlier. Can't get no way, can't draw no pay. Unemployment getting worse every day. Nothing to eat, no place to sleep. All night long, folks walking the street. Dog gone. I mean, the panic is on. Bad policies on the part of banking, business, and government greatly helped not only to cause the depression, but to prolong it. When the value of stocks collapsed, banks lost their money. That's bad enough, but it wasn't just their money they were losing. It was the money of their depositors. So uh, this is the cause of what's referred to as great bank panics of the early 1930s, where people would rush to the bank in fear that their savings literally were gone. In many cases, they were. There were, in the United States in the 1920s, 25,000 banks. 
25,000 different banking corporations doing business, some of them doing business in areas no larger than a single county. So banks didn't have the resources and the reserves to uh, weather a storm like this. Some of the causes of the Depression were inherent in the nature of laissez-faire industrial capitalism itself. New technologies and management techniques had resulted in dramatic increases in productivity, which caused the supply of goods to greatly exceed demand. In order to remain profitable, many businesses had to cut jobs and wages. The distribution of wealth and incomes was becoming increasingly unequal. There are a variety of reasons for this. One of them has to do with severe hardship in the agricultural sectors of the economy. Uh, inadequate rainfall, drought, bad harvests. Some of it had to do with the impacts of mechanization and technological change that grew out of World War I. Finally, in the industrial areas, wages were not keeping up with profits. Now, by the time of the stock market crash in the fall of 1929, consumer spending was already weakened in the economy because consumers couldn't keep up the rate of growth in their spending on goods and services. When sales decline, profitability declines. And when profitability declines, you have the ingredients of a collapse, of a, of a depression. The Great Depression wasn't limited to the United States. The Depression has to be understood as a global event. And many of the countries affected uh, responded in a kind of reflex way by trying to protect themselves from the shocks that were roiling through the international system as a whole by throwing up great, huge protective tariff barriers around their economies so that they could keep whatever business there was at home. And country after country, in the United Kingdom, and France, and Germany, the United States, Japan, all of them reverted to these protectionist and economically isolationist policies when the shock of the Depression happened. And in fact, that response helped pro deep, both deepen and prolong the Depression. The Hoover administration took some steps to mitigate the effects of the Depression, but they were too slow and too small to halt the rapidly spreading crisis. Hindsight is 2020, but at the time, the Hoover administration did not fully grasp the scope of the problem. The government, in fact, did not regularly compile things like unemployment statistics, so nobody knew for sure just exactly how big this crisis was. Now, it turns out by 1932-33, we think the unemployment numbers go up to about 13 million people one out of every four workers. But nobody could really see that clearly because the data gathering services weren't there to, to report on it. We have done all we can do. There is nothing more to be done. Hoover's approach to the mass poverty of the Depression was to leave it to state and local authorities to deal with the problem. But states and towns were quickly overwhelmed by the thousands of unemployed, homeless, and hungry citizens. To a degree, what Hoover was counting on was volunteerism. He really did think that church groups, that the local governments, that the state governments would rise to the occasion and take care of this extreme poverty created by the Depression. And it didn't work. He took the action that economists later said was correct to shore up the basic banking, credit, uh, and financial system of the country. He did take that action. But the one component that was missing was this direct relief component. And it's because he believed in this voluntarism. And he was very disappointed in Americans, never really quite comprehending the severity of that depression on them and the impact that it was going to have on their ability to volunteer or to take care of themselves. During the Depression, uh, Dad was unable to get work. He was living off of our Depression stipend. Mother, being the seamstress, had a shop down on Granville Street here in Chicago. And people from the hotel next door knew about it. They'd come in and they'd say, oh, I saw the most wonderful film last night with Carol Lombard. And she had a wonderful gown. Would you make me a gown like that? At any rate, that's how she brought us through 
the depression. Things were very, very poor on our part of South Dakota. The families didn't have enough to eat. Uh, there are two or three families that gave children away so that the children would have a better home. The government had virtually no programs to feed people or anything. It was pretty hard. Um, it was less so for my mother and dad because my dad had a job with the oil company and they were able to eat. I don't think they had much in the way of luxuries or anything like that, but they were able to go through it. I used to ask my grandmother when I was a child how the depression affected them. And she said, well, we were always so poor, it didn't matter, you know. She said, uh, they, they always had their own farms and their gardens and cows and chickens and pigs. So they were pretty self-sufficient. My husband was born and raised in San Francisco, Chinatown, and he had a big family. And he was um, the seventh child. And uh, so during the Depression years, he remembers being the family scrounger. You know, when people throw away fish heads and fish parts and chicken parts in the produce markets down there that they didn't want anymore, people were allowed to go through and pick out what they wanted. They would trim the greens uh, like cauliflowers, and I would pick up the trimmings, and that would be our vegetables. And then they would have 50-gallon barrels uh, where they would throw the chicken, duck, and turkey feet. And we would take those home, and Mom would make that into a uh, edible version of uh, snacks. And that's how we got some of our protein. And then I would go down and ask the butcher for uh, beef liver or pork liver or whatever kind of liver they had free for the cats. To save face, the butcher never asked you how many cats you had. They knew how many kids there were in the Fung family, so they would give you a big chunk of liver, knowing that you don't have a cat. <laughs> but it's only in retrospect that I can say that they were hard and difficult times, but we didn't realize it at that time because we were all in the same circumstance. It was tough for my father. He would go to the uh, farmer's market around three o'clock in the morning and see where he could buy the cheapest amount of potatoes or onions or apples or whatever that he could sell. I had my own uh, push cart and I would go with my father when he got his stuff I would get something and then I'd make my own display and we had enough. As kids we ate everything on the table we never left anything over. And if one of us didn't left something over, somebody else would grab it and finish it. The inability to find work and to support their families drove some men to abandon their homes and travel across the country by rail, looking for work or handouts. Few women rode the rails. In fact, one writer